for so many people, they had this period of time when they felt like they were getting nowhere. And for those of you listening who are thinking, oh my gosh, I'm stuck, I'm in a rut. You're actually not. You may think you are, but you're not. Welcome to The Best New Ideas in Money, a podcast for MarketWatch. I'm Stephanie Kelton. I'm an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. And I'm Charles Passy, a reporter at MarketWatch. Each week, we explore innovations in economics, finance, technology, and policy that rethink the way we live, work, spend, save, and invest. So, Stephanie, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, for a while, I thought I was going to be a detective, kind of like Cagney and Lacey. All right. For me, I wanted to be a professional basketball player, which is really odd because I wasn't very good at basketball. It shouldn't come as any surprise. Kids dream up all kinds of different futures for themselves. But at some point, we lose that ability. It becomes harder to envision a different future, to reinvent yourself. This week, we've got another book club episode for you, and it's one that might just help you do that. I spoke with Joanne Littman, author of Next, The Power of Reinvention in Life and Work. She also happens to be someone I used to work with at the Wall Street Journal. Joanne has always been a great storyteller, and this interview was no exception. She began by telling me about a time back in her early Wall Street Journal days when she was covering the advertising industry. She went to interview an ad executive at a firm called J. Walter Thompson for a story. Now, this was in the 80s. I was covering the burger wars between McDonald's and Burger King. He had Burger King. So I went in to interview him really early one morning. And I remember I was super grumpy because I am not a morning person. And I meet him in his office and he's like, oh, I've been awake for hours already because, and he told me, you know, what he really wanted to be was a novelist. And he said, I even got a book published. And he hands me this book across the desk. He's so proud. I think nothing of it. I put it in my bag. I forget about it. I did look up the Kirkus review of it, and Kirkus called it abysmal. So, you know, I do remember reading it and thinking, good thing this guy has a day job. So I was super surprised when, I want to say maybe 10 years later, I suddenly see him popping up on TV in a commercial, holding up this book called Along Came a Spider and saying, hi, I'm James Patterson. Yes, that James Patterson, the one who has sold more than 425 million books. So how did James Patterson go from ad exec to one of the most successful American authors? Well, it turns out his story followed a series of steps. And as Lipman was researching other people who reinvented themselves for her book, those same steps kept coming up over and over again. When I was reporting the book, I talked to all of these experts who studied different kinds of transformations. Some were psychologists, some were neuroscientists, some were career gurus, and they all described what the process of a successful transformation looks like. And while they were using different language, each one of them was actually describing exactly the same process. And it broke down into this search, struggle, stop solution. Search, struggle, stop, solution. It sounds simple, but according to Littman, it's anything but. So search is really cool. This is the first step, and it is when you are collecting information. And the fascinating thing about search is for many, if not most of the people I interviewed, it was not conscious. It was unintentional. It was an interest. It was a hobby. It was a side hustle. It was something they like to read about. But they weren't consciously thinking about changing their life or changing their career. The struggle comes in next, step two. Now, that is when you start separating yourself from your previous life. You start realizing there's something else here. I want to move forward to something else. But you haven't quite gotten to where that something else is. You're stuck in the middle. It's not comfortable and it can last for a while. And we don't like to talk about it. Like in any of these success stories, transformation stories that we tell ourselves, whether it's Cinderella or Superman or Spider-Man, or for that matter, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, business idol who goes from college kid to tech billionaire. There is no middle in those stories we tell ourselves. But in fact, in real life for all of us, there is this struggle. The struggle can often not end until you reach the third step. 
Lippmann says when it comes to that third step, stop, it's not part of every reinvention. But the majority of people she interviewed for Next did experience a stop in some form. The stop is something that stops you in your tracks. It might be something that you initiate, like I quit my job, or it could be something that is forced onto you, like you lose your job, or it could be, you know, there's an illness or a death in the family. That stop is actually super important because that is when everything else, sort of all of these pieces that have been floating around, coalesce. And they coalesce into this idea of like, okay, now I've got it. I know what this new identity is. And that leads to the fourth step, the solution. Arriving at that solution, your reinvented self, takes a lot of work. But first, let's break down those initial steps a bit more, starting with the first one, search. I asked Lippmann how search plays out in our everyday lives. If you think about the business books that we have all been brought up on, like Think and Grow Rich, they tell you, you must have a goal and then you got to plan backwards. And guess what? Like, okay, that makes sense. If you know you want to be a doctor, there are certain steps, yes. But for so many of the people I talked to, they didn't know where they would end up. They were searching unintentionally. In the book, Lippmann writes about Will Brown, a Harvard-trained economist who worked for J.P. Morgan. He and his wife bought a farmhouse as a weekend escape. And it had some pasture around it. And he said, we only bought the house because my wife said, we're only buying this farmhouse if we never have animals. <laughs> and so he leased it out to a farmer. You know, for a number of years, he very slowly through osmosis starts learning about birthing the cows, castrating the male cows when they're born, you know, shooing the cows back in when they escape from the field. But ultimately, after a few years, the farmer, the owner of the cows died. So he said, you know what, we'll just buy the cattle. How hard can it be? All they do is eat grass. So it turns out it's really hard. And it also turns out that cows have calves. So suddenly his herd is growing and growing and growing. He ultimately leaves the bank, becomes a, you know, a one-man shop consultant, which allows him more time to spend on the farm. But then it becomes more and more and more time consuming as this herd grows. Ultimately, he reached that stop point where he and his wife sat down and said, you know what, this is getting out of hand. We have to sell the farm or we have to commit to being full-time farmers. And ultimately the farm won. But as Will said to me, he said, look, we never in a million years ever would have said, oh, I think I'll quit my job and become a farmer. He said, that is just not a sensible thing to do. But he had the benefit of searching without realizing he was searching on the weekends, over the years, and just being pulled into it. Of course, it's easier for some people to make the leap financially and significantly harder for others. We'll get more into that later in the episode. Back to our steps. As mentioned, after the search comes the struggle. We like to imagine some will be lucky enough with any given venture that we won't have to go through that. I asked Lippmann, why do we have to struggle? So the struggle is so important because it is where all the work gets done. It's when you feel like you are treading water, spinning your wheels, pick your analogy, and it doesn't feel good. And we tend just to ignore it and not talk about it when we tell ourselves all these success stories. It's so essential that you go through this period. And it may only last, you know, a few weeks, but it could last years. One of the coolest guys who I met is a guy named Chris Donovan. He was a telephone repairman for many years. He's this big, burly, bearded guy who like, he said, I was brought up, like you don't have a career, you get a job. So he was for a number of years working as a repairman. And in his spare time, he had kind of a secret hobby, which was he made these doodles, these drawings that were actually sort of architectural drawings that were quite masterful and fantastical of shoes, of women's shoes. He didn't share it with anyone because, you know, like it, this is not like a real thing. This is just like a little fun thing on the side. And then he met his now husband and finally showed his pictures to someone, these drawings. And his husband said, oh my God, you are like seriously talented. And he went through this struggle, Chris did, because now somebody is saying to him, like, you have real potential as a designer. And for him, this struggle lasted a number of years until he got his stop, 
the stop was he was stricken with cancer, with prostate cancer. You know, luckily he recovered, fully recovered, but that stop is what made him literally stop in his tracks and say, what am I doing with my life? Like, do I want to live out my life as a phone repairman or do I want to try and see if I have another destiny? And when he recovered, he took early retirement, went back to design school. And today he is a couture shoe designer. But Donovan didn't forget that struggle. Instead, he honored it. His designs have paid homage to his origins as a phone repair man. Some of his shoes actually feature telephone parts. For so many people who I spoke to, they had this period of time when they felt like they were getting nowhere. And for those of you listening who are thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know where I want to go. Like I'm stuck. I'm in a rut. You're actually not. You may think you are, but you're not. Coming up, we've covered how the search and struggle lead to the solution of reinvention. But what are some of the potential detours along the way? We'll find out after the break. Welcome back to the best new ideas in money. Before the break, Joanne Lippman talked about the formula behind so many successful reinventions. A search leads to struggle, which often results in a stop and brings you to your solution. But there can also be some wrinkles in the process. Let's get back into the conversation. In the book, you write about overthinking. So I'm wondering, how can that impact us or derail us? In real life, so many of us tend to overthink, right? We tend to do the pros and cons and you write it out and you endlessly cogitate over it. And the problem is when we do that, we end up kind of getting all bollocked up. There's been a bunch of research that has shown that when we overthink, we tend to make the wrong decisions. I think New Coke was a good example of that. Talk a little bit about overthinking and New Coke. I covered this back in a long time ago at the Wall Street Journal. This was in the era of Coke versus Pepsi. They would do a taste test and they would do it on TV and Pepsi kept winning. And Coke said, we have got to win the taste test. So they reformulated to essentially taste more like Pepsi. And they did tons and tons of research using this test, like this SIP test. So here's the problem. The SIP test is a whole lot different than drinking a whole glass or a whole can of Coke. So the SIP test, Pepsi was winning because it's sweeter. In a whole can, it tastes different. And Coke drinkers went absolutely insane, absolutely crazy. And it was such pushback that Coke immediately had to reintroduce what it called classic Coke, back to the old formula again. It was a classic case of doing too much research. What's really interesting is we have, particularly now, much more so than then, CEOs, corporate leaders, business leaders have so much data at their fingertips. And yet, I talked to business school professors who study this, who said when they have to make major decisions, particularly capital decisions, where to spend their money, they actually don't pay attention to vast swaths of the data. Instead, they go with their gut. And I found that fascinating. But once these professors and researchers explained it to me, it made a lot of sense because your gut feeling, it seems like it comes out of nowhere, but it actually is sort of a subconscious accumulation of knowledge and data that you have acquired that you may not have synthesized consciously yet, but that you have this expertise and you have a good feeling about what is the right move. So if you're looking to reinvent yourself, pay attention to when you're overthinking and what your gut is telling you. Littman has advice on how to do just that. One of the ways to do that is to first imagine what are called possible selves. This is a psychological term, but essentially it just means imagine what you might be or could be and really think about it, which that's the first step to actually making a move is to kind of imagine yourself that way. Like James Patterson, the writer, told me he imagined himself as a novelist. But it's not enough just to imagine it. You have to take action on it. And so even if it's just a small step, I mean, James Patterson took a big step of attempting to write books while he was still at the ad agency. But for a lot of people, it could just be take a course or shadow someone and share your 
goal your ideas with someone else. Because that's another thing that the research has shown that if you share your ideas, you are far more likely to execute on them. You know, with all this overthinking and all these other things, we're sort of maybe also skipping over the fact that a lot of these people fail along the way, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, is it? No, definitely not. Definitely not. I mean, failure is so important to the process. Failure is the way you learn. But one of the things that I found in my research is that sometimes we fail wrong and there's a right and a wrong way to fail. There's a wonderful data scientist at Northwestern who actually studies failure. And he found two things. One is that very often failure is actually because we stop trying too soon. And the second thing that he found is failures actually are iterative. So a successful failure is you examine what went wrong, but rather than throwing out the entire idea and starting from scratch, you make tweaks. One thing I wondered as I read through the book is that, you know, clearly for many people, reinvention is totally possible. And there's a great roadmap that you're providing here. But it's complicated by demographics, by race, by gender, just by the plain reality of not having the money or time. I mean, it seems like a good number of these people had also the benefits, say, of a spouse who had a steady job, so it sort of afforded them that time or that financial freedom to pursue something. I'm wondering if reinvention is maybe not possible for all. Yeah, that's a really, really, really great point. And I do think you need to have some level of support, not necessarily to be wealthy, because I interviewed people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, and having money doesn't mean you're going to be successful, and not having money doesn't mean you can't do it. But for certain groups, it is more difficult. People of color, women, they don't get the same opportunities, the same mentoring, and they don't have the flexibility they need. And it is, on the one hand, much harder for them in the mainstream workforce. But on the other hand, they actually tend to be better and more likely to embark on reinvention. There's a lot of research out there that shows that, particularly in these last few years, entrepreneurial ventures by women soared and the figures are about twice as high for Black women as for women in general. There's a researcher named Deborah O'Neill who has studied the arc of women's careers and found it follows very closely to the stages that I've laid out, the search, struggle, stop, the stop being often where they lose their job or they're squeezed out. But the solution for them is often both entrepreneurial, but also very mission-driven and tends to be far more fulfilling, which is really interesting. You see a lot of women who will end up in roles that actually are helping other women or, you know, helping others, paying it forward. I want to end with a question that stuck out to me almost from the start of this book. It seems to me that we're sort of in a golden age of reinvention. Do you agree? A hundred percent. You are right on the money. So many people are burned out and they're looking for a meaningful, more meaning in their career or in their lives. A lot of people, a lot of us have been feeling sort of unmoored. And I mean, if you think about it, you know, three years ago, we were all stopped in our tracks. And whether you were a first responder or whether you were one of us knowledge workers who got sent home, your life completely changed, right? The world just shook. And we had to figure out where are we going to go from here? And I actually started the book very early on in the pandemic because I had one of those things. I woke up in the middle of the night. I'm like, we got to figure out where is this new normal? There's no guide to get us there. And so that's when I embarked on all the research and the interviews to create next. And what's interesting is here we are three years later, exactly. And it feels more urgent now than it even did before. Thanks for listening to the best new ideas in money. You can subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating or review. And if you have ideas for future episodes, drop us a line at bestnewideasinmoney at marketwatch.com. Thanks to Joanne Lipman. To learn more about new ideas in the evolution of work, head to marketwatch.com. I'm Stephanie Kelton. And I'm Charles Passy. The Best New Ideas in Money is a podcast from MarketWatch. The producers are Michael McDowell, Meta Lutzhoff, and Katie Ferguson, who also mixed this episode. Melissa Haggerty is the executive producer. Nathan Vardy was our newsroom editor on this episode. The Best New Ideas in Money theme was composed by Sam Retzer. 
Stephanie Kelton is an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University and not part of the Market Watch newsroom. We'll be back next week with another new idea.